Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to do an overview of the most common reactions of alcohols. So if you're about to cover alcohols in your class, you'll have a decent idea of what's coming up. And the first thing that we need to talk about when it comes to alcohols is the acid-base chemistry of those guys. The pKa value of the alcohols is typically ranges somewhere around 16 to 18, which means that they are not particularly acidic. However, if we react an alcohol with a sufficient strong base will lose that proton. Typically, if we want to completely deprotonate an alcohol, we are going to use sodium hydride, which is not only a powerful base that can easily deprotonate an alcohol, but also the core product in this case is going to be hydrogen gas, which will just fly away and leave a clean product. And once our alcohol is deprotonated, we are going to form the alkoxide anion. And you gotta keep in mind that the alkoxides are both decent bases and they're also strong nucleophiles. An alkoxide's nucleophilicity is inversely correlated with its size. The bulkier the alkoxide, the less nucleophilic it is. And since alkoxides are both bases and nucleophiles, they can potentially act as either in chemical reactions. And generally speaking, if we have a non-bulky alkoxide, it is going to act as a nucleophile with a primary alkyl halide, yielding a substitution product, and as a base with a secondary or tertiary alkyl halides, yielding the corresponding alkenes. And of course, if your alkoxide is way too bulky to be nucleophile, like for instance in the case of a third butoxide or something of that sort, then they are going to act as a base regardless of the alkyl halide structure. We also know a reaction between an alkoxide and a primary alkyl halide as Williamson ether synthesis. And naturally, there are a few exceptions and edge cases here and there, so if you need a refresher, check out my video on the predictive model for the substitution elimination reaction and all the links are below. Now, moving on, the next important transformation that alcohols can undergo is dehydration reaction that gives us alkenes. There are a few different ways how we can perform the dehydration reaction. And probably the most straightforward way is the dehydration with the strong non-nucleophilic acids, something like sulfuric or phosphoric acids, and of course some heat to promote this reaction. This is a typical E1 reaction that produces a carbocation intermediate, and, as with any carbocation intermediate, we run a risk of a carbocation rearrangement. So always make sure you are checking all your carbocations that you will make in your reactions for any possible rearrangements. Remember, if a carbocation can rearrange to give you a more stable carbocation, it absolutely will do so. Now, in terms of regiochemistry, the dehydration, the E1 style dehydration, typically gives you the Zeitz of product as the major product, which is usually the most substituted alkene. There are of course factors that can potentially prevent the formation of the most substituted double bond, but for as long as you are working with simple molecules that don't have any fancy stereochemical limitations, like for instance, I don't know, bicyclic compounds or something of that sort, you should always be aiming for the most substituted alkene as your major product. Now, if we want to avoid any rearrangement, we can use a softer dehydration technique using something like phosphorus phosphorus oxychloride. Some students call it POCOL3, which I think sounds kind of funny, but hey, if it helps you remember your reagents, I say go for it. Now, the important feature of this reaction is it converts the OH group of our alcohol into a good leaving group, and the reaction then proceeds via the typical E2 reaction mechanism, giving you, if possible, the Zeitz of product as well. However, since in this case we are not going to be making any carbocation intermediates, we are not going to expect to see any carbocation rearrangements either. So this is going to be a good choice of a reagent for secondary alcohols that are sitting next to a tertiary or quaternary positions that would be prone towards the rearrangement otherwise. Like for instance here in my bottom case where I have a secondary alcohol that can easily rearrange, I'm going to end up with a rearranged product, but if I want to avoid it, I'm going to use my phosphorus oxychloride, my POCOL3 in pyridine, and no rearrange is going to be on the horizon for us. Now, occasionally, we'll need to convert our alcohol into a corresponding halide.
highlight. Typically, you'll see this in a multi-step synthesis where you need uh, to use some sort of a reaction that is unique to alkyl halides. So, for instance, if you need to make, let's say, a greener reagent, uh, you'll need to have a corresponding alkyl halide. And since there are a lot of synthetic pathways that yield alcohols, it makes them a perfect intermediate for such a conversion where the formation of a halide directly might not be an option. So, like in this very generic scheme that I have on the screen, I can form my alcohol through whatever reactions I need, then I can convert that into alkyl halide, make a green yard reagent, and then do whatever else I need to do with this reaction. And probably one of the most direct ways we can convert our alcohols into the corresponding alkyl halides is by treating our alcohols with hydrogen halides. This is going to be a typical SN1 reaction, and it has all the limitations of the unimolecular reactions, namely carbocations. Yes, we are back to those pesky carbocations and their rearrangements. So this means that you should only be attempting this reaction with tertiary alcohols or maybe secondary alcohols that are going to be unlikely to rearrange. As unimolecular reactions are always in the competition with each other, and I mean SN1 and E1 reactions here, of course, this substitution might give you a lot of unwanted side products, regardless of what you use as a starting material. So this reaction truly limits us to relatively simple molecules and tertiary positions. So what should we do if we don't want to risk the formation of the carbocation intermediates? Well, there are quite a few different reagents we can choose from. The most common one is going to be phosphorus trihalide, such as trichloride or tribromide. These reagents convert alcohols into the corresponding alkyl halides in essentially an SN2 fashion. Like in the reaction with phosphorus oxychloride from before, we are going to make our alcohol into a good living group. And then the living group is going to be replaced with our halide. As this is an SN2 reaction, you gotta be mindful of your stereochemistry. The SN2 reactions invert stereochemistry, and this reaction is certainly not an exception. So you'll have to keep in mind the inversion when you're planning your synthesis, especially when it comes to a multi step synthesis where the stereochemistry of the final product matters. And talking of living groups, in the last few examples, we kept on seeing that alcohols must be converted into a good living group and then something happens to them. Either it is a substitution or elimination reaction or whatever else. Well, can we just convert an alcohol into a good living group without that extra step after? Well, of course we can. The most common way of the alcohol activation is via the formation of the sulfonate esters. And you are most likely going to see the tosylate as the most commonly used reagent in your course. However, triflate and mesylate are the other two common sulfonates that you also might encounter in your organic chemistry studies or maybe in your textbook. While these are not exactly the same, we are going to treat them as synonymous reagents and they are going to be interchangeable for our purposes. Now, most instructors are going to skip the mechanism for the sulfonate formation, but if you need to know how exactly it works, I have a dedicated tutorial for this reaction as well. And the cool part of this reaction is, once we convert our alcohol into a living group, we can easily perform either a substitution or an elimination reaction, giving us whatever product we need. And we can definitely just keep our sulfonate esters in a bottle for future use, so we don't have to do the reaction immediately either. And also, since we don't have to do it in one reaction mixture, we can potentially do the substitution or elimination reactions that would be potentially incompatible with the conditions that we've used in the previous examples. So I can guarantee you are going to see the sulfonate esters in your course quite often. Now, the next important reaction of alcohols is the oxidation reaction. I have a series of dedicated videos on the various types of uh, alcohol oxidations, and it's definitely a large and complex topic. So here I'm just going to do a quick overview. We classify our alcohols as primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols according to how many other carbons are attached to the carbon with the OH group. Tertiary alcohols, they do not oxidize, so we can just forget about those. Now, when it comes to the primary alcohols, they can oxidize halfway to the corresponding aldehyde, 
or they can go all the way to the carboxylic acid. And depending on the oxidation conditions and the choice of the reagent that you are going to be using here, we can control our reaction and make it either stop at the formation of the aldehyde or go all the way to the carboxylic acid. The common reagents that you are going to be using to oxidize your alcohols to aldehydes and stopping at that point are going to be PCC, PDC, Swern oxidation, or maybe desmartin per iodinane or D. DMP for short. These reagents are all used in non-aqueous conditions and typical solvent for us here is going to be DCM, the chloromethane. If however we are using aqueous conditions and reagents like the Jones reagent or chromic acid, then we are going to see a complete oxidation of our primary alcohols all the way to the corresponding carboxylic acids. And since aldehydes are going to be intermediates in this reaction, if you have an aldehyde somewhere in your molecule in addition to your primary alcohol, aldehyde is also going to be oxidized to the carboxylic acid as well. When it comes to the secondary alcohols, well, that part is easy. We are not going to have any issues with our product choices whatsoever. Those guys will always oxidize to the ketone regardless of the conditions and the reagents you might use for your oxidation. And the last thing I want to talk about is protecting groups that we are going to use with alcohols. Well, there are actually quite a few different ones. Probably the most common one is going to be the silyl protection. And there are two common uh, silicon-based protecting groups that you are going to most likely see in your course. Those are trimethylsilyl group and terbutyldimethylsilyl groups. And we apply both by reacting the alcohol with the corresponding silyl chloride. So if you have an alcohol and you want to put the TMS group on, you react it with the corresponding chloride. Likewise, if you want to put your TBDMS on it, you react it with the corresponding chloride. The benefit of those protecting group is that they are very resilient towards the acidic and basic conditions. And since these protecting groups are so stable, they are quite universal and will suit most application you might need for your synthesis. And so if those groups are so stable, how are we going to take them off? Well, it turns out that they do have one major vulnerability, and that vulnerability is the fluoride ion. As soon as we bring the silyl ethers in contact with the solution that contains fluoride ions, the group easily pops off. So we are going to use either triethyl ammonium fluoride, or TIF, or tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride, TBAF, as our reagents to take the protecting group off and reform the alcohol once we are done with whatever we are doing with our molecule. So, as you can see, alcohols are a very versatile functional group and can afford a lot of different transformations. Are these all the reactions of alcohols? Well, of course not. But these are the most common ones that you are bound to see in your course and are expected to know for the ACS, MCOT, and many other standardized tests. And if you want more details about any of those reactions, I have dedicated tutorials on all of them as I kept on mentioning throughout the video. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, remember to boop the like button and tell me your favorite alcohol reaction in the comments below. Your likes and comments really help in promoting my videos, helping more students like yourself learn chemistry and succeed in academic careers. Subscribe for daily organic chemistry updates, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!